Heavenly Father, the passage before us this morning is so deep, so rich. There's so many details and nuances about it. I pray that you would give me the words, Lord, that I may connect the dots in a way that's helpful, that the main point would be the main point that comes across in these next few minutes. That you would use the truth in this text to challenge us, to call us forth to a greater level of commitment, to a greater degree in obedience, albeit resting, depending on you and not in ourselves. We need your help. We need your work. We need you to encourage our hearts. We need you to give us the confidence to live as we should. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life that it gives, for the peace that we have in Christ, for the satisfaction that we have found in him. And we pray that our lives would increasingly bring glory to the name of our Savior. In his precious name we pray, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. We'll be looking at verses 13 to 27. John 18, 13 to 27. As human beings, we have a general tendency to seek the approval of others, to seek the approval of those around us, especially those whom we consider our peers, those whom we consider our equals. We want to be seen in a positive light. And on the flip side, we avoid being seen as less, being disrespected, being hated or ridiculed. And this isn't necessarily bad. It's the way God has made us as social creatures to function within a civilized society, to function within groups of people and relationships. But it becomes bad when it prevents us from doing what is right, when it becomes an obstacle to obedience. When we want to please people, more than we want to please God, we are experiencing what the Bible calls the fear of man. In our passage today, we see Christ stand unmoved in the face of pressure from ungodly and powerful men, while at the same time we see Peter caving in to pressure and denying Christ. Now our context here in John chapter 18, last week we, or not last week, but the last time that I preached, we saw our Lord arrested, right? We saw him betrayed and arrested. But in that passage, in the first 12 verses of this chapter, we saw Jesus showing courage and power in allowing his arrest. He showed his power when he identified himself as deity and the guards fell back. He showed his power in healing the servant who Peter had injured by cutting off his ear. In our portion today, we see the glory of Christ manifested in his attitude in the face of injustice so that we may trust in him and not in ourselves. Let's go ahead and read our passage, John chapter 18, and we will be looking at verses, we'll start in verse 12. Technically, our passage starts in verse 13, but 12 was a connection that we need to read to understand 13. So we'll start in 12 and go all the way down to 27. John 18, 12. 
So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you? In the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. So, our narrative today, like a good story, goes from one scene to another and back. So, it was a little hard. It's a little hard to outline this as we usually do with three points or four points. And so, we're just going to outline it as the narrative gives it as two acts in a play, as it were. So we're going to outline it like this. Act 1 of Jesus' confession is verses 13 and 14. Act 1 of Peter's denial is verses 15 through 18. Act 2 of Jesus' confession is verses 19 through 24. And Act 2 of Peter's denial is 25 through 27. So I don't know if that made sense. The, the story itself is shifting between what's happening with Peter on the outside and then what's happening with Jesus inside the high priest home. So let's go ahead and start. And first we look at the first part is Act 1 of Jesus' confession in verses 13 through 14. But let me read 12 as well. 12 says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now we could just pass over this, but we need to recognize this is the first time in the Gospels that Jesus is no longer acting as a free agent. They have tried to arrest him, they've tried to stone him, and different things before they could never get their hands on him. This is the first time that he is under the power under the control of sinful men. And we talked about it a little bit last time, but Jesus' obedience can be divided into active obedience, his active obedience to the will of the Father, and passive obedience, him allowing all these things that are going to happen to him now as he goes to the cross. He is in passive obedience. Unlike us in a situation like this who would have no power, Jesus can stop what's happening. And so he is allowing this to happen to him in obedience to the will of the Father. So verse 13 says, First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. 
Who is this man? This is, this is a man that is not currently the official high priest, but has held the title before for several years. He's had the title previously, and after him, five of his sons held the title of high priest as well as his son-in-law, who it mentions here. You see, the high priest was supposed to be an appointment for life, according to the Mosaic law. But the Romans were in charge of Israel at this time, of Judea, and that whole area. And they were appointing the high priest as they wanted to. And so he had been relieved of that duty. And right now his son-in-law, at this point in time, his son-in-law is the one who, who has that. It says the one, in our text you're going to see several times, the one who was high priest that year. Does that mean that every year they were changing? Not necessarily. The records don't indicate that it changed every year, but it indicates that year is like saying at that time, at the time when Jesus was crucified, he was the one who was officially the high priest. He was a man that is still very powerful, as we can see. He had a lot of influence. Even though he was not officially the high priest, you can imagine in a patriarchal society that when his sons were high priest, who was controlling? He was. When his son-in-law is high priest, who is controlling? He was still very much in control. And we see that by the fact that they bring Jesus to him first for a sort of pre-trial before he goes to Caiaphas. But also, Annas was very corrupt. He was known. We can go back and look at the writings of his Pharisees, the enemies, and different people of that time. He was known for being a corrupt man. He's very cunning and very greedy. In fact, if you remember when Jesus cleared out the market at the temple, that market was called the Bazaar of Annas. And you know what he would do is he would, they would, at that market, people would bring their sacrifice and they would say, well, this, this isn't good enough. And make them buy an animal from that market, which was a very high price, and he would get some of that money. So he is not, not a good man. Why did they bring him instead of to Caiaphas to Annas. Well, it may be that he was the one that was really calling the shots, that he had made this plan. It may be that he's the one that made the deal with Judas to bring Jesus. And so naturally, if he was the one making the deal, or he's the one that gave the order, when they arrested Jesus, they brought him back to him to report back. And honestly, we don't know. We don't know why. But we do know that that's what happened. That first, they brought him to, to Annas. It's interesting. I, we've, we've seen as we've gone through the Gospel of John that John is not repeating what the synoptics already tell us, right? And so it's interesting that this pre-hearing is only included in the Gospel of John. It's something that he feels important to mention, and he is complementing what the synoptics are already telling us. And actually, if you look at the synoptics, they all focus a little bit differently, right? They're writing from a different point of view. They're including sometimes mostly the same information, but sometimes they focus on different things. And if you look at this passage specifically, they focus on different hearings for the most part. John focuses on this one. If we continue, look at verse 14. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, why is this mentioned? This doesn't have anything to do directly with our story. It's mentioned as a side note. Why is it mentioned? Well, it's mentioned for several reasons, but let's go ahead and turn back to chapter 11 verse 47, where we see this unfold. 
chapter 11, verse 47 through 53. We're still in the book of John, by the way. John eleven forty seven. 47. So the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Note this verse. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. John mentions this to point us back to what happened here and say this whole trial is a farce. They had already determined that Jesus was guilty. Caiaphas had said, it's better that one innocent man die than that the whole nation be lost. And basically, he's not really interested in that, but he's telling the other people in power, if a revolt happens and the Romans come in and squash it, we're going to lose all our power. And of course, the Lord had him say that because it has further implications concerning the redemption, right? That one man would die to save others, to save many. But the reason it's included here is to tell us that this is a kangaroo court, and there's already a plan. This whole thing is planned out as a way to get rid of Jesus. Going back to our text now, we see now that the scene turns from Jesus arriving at the residence of the high priest to Peter. We see that here in verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. So first we have to ask ourselves, Simon Peter was in the garden, right? In verse 12, where has Simon Peter been between verse 12 and verse 15? Well, Matthew 26, 56 says, Then all the disciples left him and fled. Peter's included in all the disciples. So Peter in the garden, deserted Christ and fled. And he didn't feel right about that, apparently, because he then comes and follows. He then comes and finds the group again and follows them to the residence. And who is this other disciple? It says, and so did another disciple. There is some some debate about this, but it's consistently um, agreed that this disciple is none other than the author of the epistle that we are reading, of the gospel we are reading, going through, who is John, the apostle John. How do we know this? Well, why would, if it was anybody else, why wouldn't he just say the name? Obviously, this person was in the garden, so he had to be one of the other 11. Why didn't he just say, well, Thomas? Because when, when John, writing this account, to not exalt himself, always uses phrases that are kind of anonymous, kind of hiding his identity. But in doing so, to us, now it's obvious that he is the person. He is the person. So it says... Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So here they are going with this group of armed men going into the residence of the high priest. And first of all, It's going to be very confusing if we don't understand one thing. As we go through this narrative, we need to understand that it appears that Annas and Caiaphas lived in the same residence, or at least they shared a common courtyard. Now, in those times, it was very common when someone would get married that they would add on another room 
to the family's household. And so that's what we see here. If you can imagine, during, as we go through this, we have two residences that are, are connected by a courtyard. And everything that happens with Peter is going to be in that courtyard. But that brings up another question. How does John know the high priest? John is connected to the high priest in some way. And many have said, this can't be true or this can't be John. Why would a fisherman from Galilee be connected to the high priest in Jerusalem? Well, there's a lot of ways that this could be, and there's been some theories. John had servants. He was, they had a fishing business. They weren't just fishermen. They had servants and, and everything. They had a business. Maybe they were involved in bringing their produce to Jerusalem, and somehow they were the ones that supplied the household of the high priest. We don't know. That may be... Um, that may be one way. It also could be that John had Levitical lineage because his mother appears to be the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is cousin to Elizabeth, and Zechariah was a priest, the parents of John the Baptist. There's also some extra biblical accounts that say that at one point the disciple John was a priest. That's not something that we can confirm, so we're not going to build the case on that. But either way, the text makes clear that he had access. He had some type of relationship with the high priest and his household that he was a friend of the family. He had access. He was able to go into the residence. And we don't hear of him in the courtyard, so it may be that he went in further where they were um, questioning Christ. So here's what we have so far. Jesus is tied up and arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and led to Anna's house by a large group of armed men and religious officers. The disciples scatter. Peter and this other disciple, Peter and John, start following, probably mixed in somewhat with the group. But upon getting to the house, Getting into the courtyard, John gets in. They recognize the the servant girl that we're going to see in a moment that is in charge of the gate recognizes John. She doesn't recognize Peter, so he's asked. He's denied access. John goes on in. He realizes that Peter has got stuck outside, and he goes back to ask that he be brought in. We see that in verse 16. It says, So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. In verse 17, we have Peter tested for the first time. Look at verse 17 with me. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. So we have a pretty low stakes situation here, right? Peter's outside trying to get in. John has already gotten in. And John goes out and says, hey, I know him. Let him in. She lets him in, but as she does, she asks him this question. It's a servant girl, the text tells us. It was very common. We see when Peter was released out of prison that he went, and it was also a servant girl, Rhoda, who opened the door, or didn't open the door for a while, and then came back and opened it. So it was common that one of the servants, usually uh, a woman, maybe a young girl, was the one that would be at the gate letting people in or denying access to whoever she knew was trustworthy. So, low stakes. What's the worst thing that could have happened at this point? She doesn't let him in. It appears that she knows that John is a disciple. The text is a little bit ambiguous, but if you read it, at least in in our English translation here, in the Greek it's a little more ambiguous. It says, "You you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? So it appears that she knew that John was a disciple, and so a disciple's already been gotten through the gate. She doesn't have any problem with that. But Peter, um, even in this low-stakes situation, 
fails, fails. The question does seem to expect a negative response, as you can see by the last two words, are you? You're not a disciple, are you? It's kind of hinting that way, right? But either way, he failed the test. The love in Peter's heart won't let him go off and forget about Christ. It draws him near, but the fear in his heart keeps him from openly identifying with his Lord. The narrative continues in verse 18. Now the servants and officers made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So it was cold at night. Interesting, the word that it uses for fire there isn't a fire of wood. Notice our text says a charcoal fire. And as you would imagine, they're in a courtyard. They're not going to start a fire that's going to make a bunch of smoke. They just had a little charcoal fire going there for, for the guards and soldiers to warm themselves. And Peter was with them. In the garden, we saw who Judas was with. Judas was with the guards. Judas was with the enemies of Christ. He was numbered with the enemies of Christ. And here we see Peter is standing among the enemies of Christ, blending in. The text now shifts. If we were watching a movie, the scene cuts, and we're back inside the residence in verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Notice that Annas is concerned about the disciples. It says that first. The disciples and the teaching. Why does he want to know about the disciples? It appears that he's, he's, he's doing somewhat of a pre-hearing. He wants to know what we're getting into here. He was the one that, he might have been the one behind this whole plan. If he stayed in power and connected so well, it's because he was politically astute. He always knew what was the risk and benefit ratio to what he was doing. And he wants to know how many disciples does this man have? What kind of things has he been teaching them? Are they going to cause a revolt? Are they going to cause a problem that we don't want right now? Or is it fine to continue with our plan? He's making an assessment, a risk assessment, if you will. And he's also asking about the teaching. He wants to know what Christ has been teaching. He knows what Christ has been teaching. He's probably heard Christ himself. He's well informed. They always had people out and about, their eyes and ears in the city and even in the country. Even up to Galilee, they sent people to check on Jesus. He knew what Jesus taught. He's trying to catch him. He's fishing for a mistake so that an accusation can be made. Jesus answers him in verse 20. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Jesus says, I don't have any secret plan. I don't have any secret scheme. I don't proclaim one thing publicly and then with my disciples in private have other teachings that I have given to them. He doesn't have a plan, but Annas has a plan. Annas has a scheme. Jesus is sincere. Everything that he believed, he had already taught. Did he teach the disciples a little bit deeper in private? Yes, but everything in private was equal with what he taught in public. It corresponded. It wasn't different. Jesus has nothing to hide. He proclaims what he believes. His words are honest and true. But he goes further in verse 21. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Now, 
If we're unaware of the laws of the time, we might think, well, that sounds a little bit going on the offense. But it's not. It's not. Jesus is calling him to be lawful. In the law, they had to ask witnesses. They had to have witnesses for and against and consider their testimonies. You weren't supposed to be asking the person, the suspect, so to speak. You would think after having arrested Jesus, the first thing that should happen is they should communicate to him the charges. Why did they arrest him? But this is, is it's all unlawful. It's all a sham. The outcome had already been determined. They weren't trying to see if he was innocent or guilty. They had decided he was guilty, even though they had no grounds for it, and were just pursuing that goal of getting rid of him. We know it's unlawful on many levels. First of all, the trial was at night. Don't you think if someone would, would be arrested, they would keep them and have a trial the next day? It was unlawful to get people together in the middle of the night and have a quick trial just to push something through. We know that it was at night because it was cold. They had the fire. At this time of the year in Jerusalem, it would get cold only at night. In the day, the weather would be good. They had torches when they went to arrest Jesus in the garden. So it's at night, which is the first thing against him. Second, they needed to bring witnesses. They couldn't. They, or they hadn't at this point. They would try to later. But they didn't have witnesses. They were questioning him. Jesus is calling Annas to be righteous, to do things correctly. He's not worried about how that's going to be taken. He's worried about things being done according to the law. But this is not well received. Look at verse 22. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? You can imagine they have Jesus there, arrested. They have guards on both sides, probably some other guards in the room. And one of the guards next to our Lord does not like the answer and slaps him. There's going to be much more mistreatment of our Lord in the next hearing, but in this hearing, this is what happens. This is what happens. Why did he do it? Maybe it was standard practice, because if we go to Acts, Acts 23, Acts 23, 1 through 5, says, And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? And those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So it appears that when they heard something they didn't like, they would have the guards slap the prisoner. In this case, it doesn't say that the guard was told, but maybe he was just trying to gain some points, trying to impress his superior. And so that's what he did. That's what he did. How does Jesus respond to that? Does he back down? Does he coward? He didn't, he didn't sin like Paul. He didn't, he didn't accuse or insult the high priest. He just said, why are you doing this? Jesus doesn't sin in it, whereas Paul does and has to retract. Look at what Jesus does in verse 23. Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? He holds his ground. He says, well, it was unlawful what you were doing, but now you've, you hit me, hit the prisoner, which is also unlawful. He doesn't back down. He just goes after the new infraction. 
We're going to come back to some of these things, but let's continue moving forward. Look at verse 24. Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So this was the second part. The first part was a pre-hearing with Annas. Then he's going to go with Caiaphas and other officers. And then after daybreak, he's going to meet again with a Sanhedrin. And maybe there was part of the Sanhedrin in the second one, but they're going to meet again for a last time for their official, now in the daytime, um, hearing. In the hearing with Caiaphas, they would have witnesses who contradict. And then Christ would admit, admit to being the Son of God and deity. And then that's where they cover him up and they beat him and say, who struck you? So they're going to strike him much more after that. The scene changes now in verses 25 and 26 back to Peter. Now Simon Peter was standing and warning, warming himself, so they said to him, you are also not one of his disciples, are you? He denied and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied, and at once a rooster crowed. So now the stakes are higher. It's not a servant girl, it's officers. I imagine they were guards, the guards that brought Jesus. Some of them went into the hearing, and the bigger group of them is outside, waiting to see if Jesus is going to be somewhere else. They have to escort him. And they're out there by the fire, in the light of the fire, they see Peter's face. Maybe he said something by other accounts. We, as he answers them, they hear a Galilean accent and identify him. The stakes are getting higher. The first time they ask him, being a disciple isn't necessarily a crime. But then the second time they ask him, it seems that he's going to be associated with injuring one of the servants of the high priest, which would be a crime. So each time the stakes are a little bit higher. And Peter fails. Peter fails. Look at verse 27. Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Peter has now denied the third time. The other accounts, John seems to be a little careful not to put Peter in such a bad light, but the other accounts say that when he was asked the second time, he swore with an oath. And after the third time, he started swearing and cursing. Peter's denial is getting worse and more sinful as it goes. We see that in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 72 says, And he again denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. And verse 74, then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man, and immediately the rooster crowed. In John, if you turn back to chapter 13, verse 38, we see what this is referring to. Well, in verse 37, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. This is the third denial of Peter. The other accounts tell us that Jesus was at this point being moved from one residence to another and looks at Peter. And Peter leaves and weeps bitterly realizing what he has done. There's a few things that we need to think about. We've seen the text. Now let's go back and analyze it a little bit. Peter and the guard. Peter and the guard are very similar. Why did the guard strike Jesus? The guard had determined the high priest is worthy of honor and this man is worthy of disrespect. And so in trying to honor 
a sinful man, he dishonored the king of glory. He had miscalculated. He had miscalculated, and that was a grave, grave mistake. He thought that the high priest was the most important man in the room, and he had offended the Son of God in order to honor a sinful man. But didn't Peter do the same thing? Peter determined it's more important to please these guards than to please Christ. What slap hurt more, the slap of Peter or the slap that Christ experienced from the foremost of his disciples denying him as he was on his way to the cross? Peter had one master at that moment, and it wasn't Christ. But there's a contrast in this text as well. Many times we see in the gospel narratives that there's contrast made. In order to see the glory of Christ clear, he's contrasted with Peter. Peter was afraid. Christ was courageous and bold. Peter panicked. Christ was calm. Our Lord, in the face of injustice, pain, and mistreatment, was steadfast and resolved. His mind was set on doing the right thing regardless of the cost, regardless of everything that he would suffer, which he's going to suffer a lot more in a few hours. This is just the beginning. But his mind is set on doing what's right regardless of the consequences. And that comes out of love for the Father and for his children. It was the love that motivated him to do this. Peter failed, and Christ was victorious. But Peter's failure is a flashing warning sign to all believers. It's a big neon sign that's flashing for all believers to see. Peter wasn't just any disciple. He was the leader of the disciples, whose name is first in the list of disciples, always Peter. Who's in the inner circle? Peter. Who's the boldest one? Peter. Did he not try to hack through a whole group of armed guards just hours before that? Had he not heard just hours before that the farewell discourse? Had he not seen the miracles of Christ? If anybody was going to stand, you would think it was Peter. And yet he didn't. He didn't. If anything, Peter had more natural courage than we do. Naturally, he was courageous. He was an A-type personality. He was like, let's do this. We're all Peter. As we look at this text, we should see ourselves right there in the garden denying Christ because we are all intrinsically flawed. We are all prone to betrayal. We're weak. We're fearful. Naturally, in our natural state, that is how we are. So we need to learn some lessons from Peter. What lessons does Peter's story, Peter's account have for us? First, we need to depend on Christ. Our resources are not enough. When we depend on ourselves, our personality, our discipline, our self-will, we will fail. We do not have what it takes to follow Christ as we should. Secondly, we need to identify with Christ early and often. The first denial was the, the easiest test was the first one. If he would, I, would have identified as a disciple right there, the whole trajectory would have been different. He wouldn't have had to deny it and again because they would have known. She would have told the others. The longer we pretend to be something we're not, the harder it's going to be to deny it later. He went from there 
and then he sat around the fire pretending to be just one other enemy of Christ. And as time went by, it was harder. Also, the battle starts before the temptation. Was it not just before this in the garden that Jesus had told Peter, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation? And Peter fell asleep. If Peter would have been able to see what would have happened in a few hours, do you think he would have fallen asleep? No. He would have found the way to stay awake and pray. He failed in the garden before he failed in the courtyard. He was warned. Christ had warned him. Another thing that we can learn is that true weakness and failure can be present in a believer. This gives us hope. We failed Christ. And when we fail Christ miserably, we can take hope and say, Peter was a believer. But even in a true believer, great weakness and failure can be found. If it was found in Peter, can it be found in us? The last lesson is that the middle ground is not a safe place. Peter's love for Christ took him on, impulsed him to follow Christ, but he didn't follow all the way. He didn't identify with Christ and say, I'm here as a disciple. He was halfway following. The middle ground is not a safe place. Partial obedience, partial submission, partial commitment puts us in a place of danger. The middle ground is a place of weakness and defeat. It's a place of delusion. In the middle ground, we think we're fine until what? The trial comes. Peter didn't know that he had this in himself. Peter was surprised by this. He never would have gone to the garden. He would have said, I'm too weak. I can't go to the garden. What would I be doing there? He thought he was stronger than he was, and the trial came and exposed him. The middle ground, following Christ halfway, is dangerous because we think we're fine until the trial rolls in and shows otherwise. It's a place of spiritual danger because it has repercussions. Being in the middle ground has repercussions for us, for our children, for our church. It's not how God designed it. So there's lessons to be learned from Peter, but now let's turn to Christ because this whole passage is showing the glory of Christ. Though we betray Him, He remains faithful. Amen to that. Though we betray Him, though we fail Him, which we will, He remains faithful. And not only that, He uses our failings to make us stronger. When you fail, don't stay there beating yourself up about your failure. Move on. Dust yourself off. Get up, dust yourself off, and move on. Look how much hope we have in Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, 31. Go there quickly. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demands... This is before the fact. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew he was going to fail. He predicted it. So he prays that his strength would not fail. That, not that he wouldn't fail and that he wouldn't deny Christ. That once he denied Christ, his faith would not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He's saying, I'm, you're going to fail. You're going to suffer. And you're going to come back stronger. And you're going to use that to bless others. You're going to use that to minister to the other disciples. God uses our failings to mature us in the faith. And when we see our lack of obedience, our failure, that's where we need to turn our gaze off of ourselves and on Christ. Because His perfect obedience is our righteousness. His perfect obedience is ours when we repent of our sin and put our trust in Him. We sang the gospel this morning in the first song. Listen to the lyrics. And meditate on them. It says, I will glory in my Redeemer. 
whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death, my only Savior before the Holy Judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness. We fail, but He doesn't fail. And His victory is ours in the midst of our failures. If you want to know more about Christ and how you can have a relationship with Him, please come and talk to one of us at any time or after the service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Christ, His perfect obedience, and the forgiveness and peace that we can have in our relationship with Him, knowing that His righteousness is accounted for us. We no longer have to fear Your wrath or an eternal destiny of judgment because of what Christ did on the cross as He took our sin and paid for it completely so that we might be forgiven and have peace with You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.